So uh, next year in prediction um, was another, like when Leah polled everyone, it seemed like this was a pretty popular model. So I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, there are again, demo videos for this already up on YouTube. Um, they're linked to in the slides here and I'll link to them again in Slack as well. And next year in prediction, um, just to talk through it, uh, it works on a process of, um, it feeds frame by frame into a uh, machine learning model and the machine learning model learns the basically the, the motion of each frame. Um, and I think what I like about this is it's not good at its job. Um, it clearly doesn't really know, understand motion very well. Um, but what it does generate is this really like pretty trippy, glitchy, expressive motion. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, but I think it's like, it's a really interesting model to just make some really cool, weird stuff from. And it also generates video pretty frequently, like pretty like seamlessly. So just kind of nice to explore how that works. Um, so this is uh, some work by Jonathan Fly looking at roller coasters. Um, I think you can see that it's kind of picking up some roller coaster motion, but it's also like nowhere near what it should be doing. Uh, so again, next year prediction is actually a special version of Pix to Pix. Um, it uses paired images to uh, try to understand uh, motion and basically doing that by checking uh, frame to frame to frame to frame. So what you end up doing is you train it and then you feed it a frame. And then after that frame, it tries to guess each frame following. And it gets further and further away from like reality as it goes. Um, so there's a tutorial here. This is the library that we're using. Um, the person who wrote the library uh, has a bunch of tutorials, explanations of how it works. He also has some advanced stuff that I don't cover in my video demo. So if you really wanna get into this, I recommend reading this tutorial. Um, the video demo that I've done um, is up. Uh, it's from one of my first classes but it hasn't changed at all. So it's still, it's still relevant. Um, and you can go ahead and watch that. That's probably the best way to learn just step-by-step step how it works. Um, the inputs for uh, pix to pix for this are a video. Um, what you'll do is once you upload the video, you'll break it into frames using FFmpeg, but actually there's a command that uh, is written into the library. Um, and then once you do, then what you, would, what you do is once it's trained is you then input a, a single video frame. And then from there, it's gonna output a number of frames uh, that are guesses after that, right? So you go to frame and ideally you give it a real frame and it tries to guess what the next frame is. And then it takes that frame and it tries to guess the next frame from that. Um, so that's how it ends up being really far from like reality pretty quickly because it's guessing frame by frame by frame. This is the demo video. I'll, I'll link to it in the slides um, and I'll link to it in Slack as well. Um, the steps for this are pretty straightforward. One thing to note is that um, I recommend that you make a video that is 1280 by 720. If you try to do anything that is outside of that range, it gets a little messy. Um, so even if you have a video that isn't this size, what you could do is you could bring it into After Effects and just like put it in a mat around that size. So if you have something that's like 16 by nine or something, you could just have black bars above and below. Um, you could crop in, like you could do any number of things, but I generally recommend that you upload something that is this size. Um, otherwise you'll run into issues um, I also recommend you make a videos folder inside of that folder um, and drop your videos in there. Uh, you'll then need to separate the frames. Um, you'll run this command that just extracts the frames. It literally just runs FFmpeg behind the scenes, but it's a little bit easier to understand than FFmpeg. So you can go ahead and do this. Um, you just point it to the video and then you give it a name. May that name is kind of important. Again, I recommend that you name it something that is coherent and makes sense to you. And then you want to pass it in the size. The fact that size doesn't match is fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but you're gonna run this command that'll give you frames. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna train this model. So you're gonna run this command. And what's really important is that the name you passed it here, or the name you passed it here when making the frames matches this. So you wanna make sure that like the name that you're using and the name of your data set match up. Um, that can be one thing that like trips people up the first time. So make sure that these, that this matches this. And in general, I just recommend that you also name your project, your video project, or like, um, I generally just recommend you name this thing the same as this, just for your own sanity. Otherwise it gets really crazy. Um, sorry, uh, the name and the video data, and the data root videos, video data set should match. Uh, otherwise you will lose your mind. This is how you test it. Sorry, I didn't realize I jumped ahead of screen. Um, once you've produced a bunch of these files, um, which are again, sort of like style again, it's sort of, they're not called pickles, but they are like essentially those types of files. Um, you can then generate videos off of those. So you're gonna pass in uh, the name of your project. 
Um, you're going to pass in your data set and then you're going to pass in uh, the frames per second you want for the video and then how many frames you want to generate. Uh, and likewise, there's a bunch of options here. There's options around how many frames you want to produce. There's options around which epoch, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, basically, this says like, uh, this is similar to like choosing what pickle file you want to generate from, right? So you've got all those pickle files and they're all numbered differently. This lets you determine which one you want to pick from. Um, and then what frame do you want to start from? So uh, by default, this will always default to like the 60th frame of the data of the video you already provided it. Um, but there are ways in which you could pass this a different image and you get a totally different result out of it. Um, so I recommend playing with all of these and just sort of seeing what you get. Um, you'll get some pretty interesting options. So one thing I do want to talk about, I think, um, James, maybe you and I were talking about this, but like, how, what's the difference between next frame prediction and style GAN, right? So how do these models differ? Because you can produce videos out of both of them. You could give both of them a, a video data set and like, wouldn't they produce the same thing? And the truth is they don't. And I'm sure you all already know that, but like the reason why is actually helpful to understand. So StyleGAN takes a bunch of images and it could be a data set, but it tries to create a generalization from, or sorry, it could be a video as a data set, but it tries to generalize that data it's given, but it doesn't understand time. So that's really, really important to understand is that it does not understand time. It doesn't understand sequence, right? If I give it a data set of 2000 frames from a video, it doesn't understand the sequence of that video. It understands that these are all separate images and I should figure out how to generalize across all these images. So this is an example, I think I showed this last, last week. This is an example of taking beach waves and bringing it into StyleGAN. Um, so, and when you play it back through the latent space, it doesn't understand that there's a sequence to these. You know, it doesn't understand that, um, that all waves have to start at the top of the screen and move down to the bottom of the screen. So by animating in this latent space, you just kind of get different generalizations or different types of, uh, of um, wave images. And that means you get this like very like uh, atemporal like sort of scene. Now, next stream prediction understands time because, and I say understands as like a very loose thing because none of these machines really understand these things, but it understands time because it understands sequence, right? So it understands a frame and then another frame and then another frame. Um, but it does not understand generalized image structure, right? That's what StyleGAN is good at, right? It can understand like this is what a beach scene looks like, whereas this thing just understands the differences or changes in a video. So one thing you might wanna do is try to slow down a video or speed up a video um, and see if it understands motion differently or if it understands the actual image better. Um, there's some interesting potential in like experimenting with those things. Um, so similarly, like this is a video that I produced. This is one of the first um, next frame prediction videos I ever did. So here's a fish and it gets blurred out. And like, if you watch this motion, you will understand that um, it's like, this is like the motion of a floating, right? Or this is the motion of a camera in water watching um, sea creatures sort of float through. And it has that very floaty feeling. But you will see that it very quickly like, the fish dissolves into, into noise or like textural things pretty quickly. And that's because it doesn't understand that there's a fish in the scene. It doesn't understand that the fish is meant to be kept throughout the scene. Um, so the fish texture kind of just appears in a bunch of places. And this is, there's a couple ways that we think that like, uh, like folks who do this work theorize that we could do a better job of it. Right now it's just looking one frame backward. But if it were looking maybe five frames backwards or 10 frames backwards, it might understand that like some of these images need to like stay, but it's almost great that this thing doesn't, right? It's like kind of special in itself that it's bad at this while also capturing the essence of these motions. Um, so some recommendations for this work uh, are next stream prediction understands basic motion. So like, I think it's really important to understand that like you really need like sort of fluid motion for it to actually learn and like work with and that anything outside of basic motion or anything that happens really, really fast, that you imagine like a camera shake, it's gonna, have, it's gonna have a bad time sort of understanding that motion because it's so uh, staccato and it changes so much frame to frame that the model sort of like can't really learn that. And that's just something I've learned over time that it's like, it's hard with like really fast motion to actually have it captured. Um, I'll also say shorter uncut videos are generally better than longer videos with hard cuts. Um, 
So by a cut, I mean like a change of scene. Um, and the reason for that is it probably makes sense, but like the difference uh, from like a cut to a cut where it's like there is no motion between those two frames is going to kind of mess with the next frame predictions like capabilities or it's going to learn that cut and like it doesn't and it just kind of messes up the generalization of things. So whereas other other places I say like you need as much data as possible here I would generally say like if you have like a 20 30 second video that's going to be better than a two minute long video that has cuts in it. Um, that's just from my own experiments uh, that that sort of works better. So just keep that in mind as well that if you have a video with a ton of cuts it's going to it's not clear to me that it's actually going to learn that motion. Um, the other recommendation I have, and this is a little different than say StyleGAN, save every one of your trained iterations. So save every epoch. Now the downside of this is these, these files are huge. Uh, so whereas StyleGAN produces models that are about 350 megabytes, um, Next Stream Prediction produces uh, models that are about 800 megabytes. So like if you do this for 200, that's like a, that's like a ton of gigabytes of files. So you might wanna be somewhat judicious with this. But what I wanna show you is that each of these iterations is very different. And again, we theorize that that happens because we're only learning one, one frame to the next. So the types of frames it's learning on matter a lot. So let me show some examples because I think it's easier to see this through example. Um, this is Epoch 39 of a certain video. So see this is a, a, a slow motion time lapse flower. So you get this kind of motion, right? It kind of opens and explodes. Um, but now it's kind of like slow motion through some things. Um, it's pretty interesting. Now the very next epoch, which again, if you were looking at StyleGAN, you would say like, oh, it's probably gonna be like just slightly better than the previous version. This video is completely different. So we get weird disco lights in this version. And this is because we're doing frame to frame. And just depending on what frames it trains on, it learns different things each time. Um, and this is just like a totally different video, but it's right next to each other. So one thing you could do is you could generate each of these videos and just like delete the ones you're not interested in. But I also would tell you like, it's worth experimenting with each of these steps because you're gonna get different motion each step. This is Epoch 145. So this is trained way, way longer. And you see it's like almost the mix of things. So the flower gets a little bit further along before it explodes, but now I'm getting these like weird flashes and I'm getting a little bit of flashing. So, and I bet if I looked at 146, I would see even like different types of motion. So what I find is that as you get um, further into your epochs, generally these very early stages of, of the flower opening in this case are gonna get closer and closer to realism, but you're still gonna get wild stuff the further out you go. And also what image you start with um, is also gonna determine how it changes. This is just like, pure chaos. Like working with next stream prediction is just like a very weird, it's sort of chaotic, but I love it. It's super glitchy. Um, it just does really weird stuff all the time. Um, so this is like pure chaos. If you like randomness, like working next stream predictions, a, a lot of fun. Um, but those are sort of my recommendations is like, you're definitely going to want a hard, like a, an external hard drive to dump this stuff onto to play with later. Um, Cause it gets really bloated really fast. Um, any questions about next stream prediction? No, good. Oh, Jim, do you have a question? Yes. So this is a little hard for me to put my head around. Yeah. But I was thinking something like a Tom and Jerry repetitive chase scene. Mm. But yeah, like if it's learning, if it's just comparing two frames, or if it's comparing that frame to like many other frames too. I think like so it's comparing two frames at a time, but every epoch it looks at a, a huge amount of those frames. Mm -hmm. So that's why I mean like fluid motion is gonna be better captured in a model like this because each frame to frame is gonna be pretty similar motion. Um, whereas as you saw with this flower thing, like you would think it's pretty similar motion, but actually like, the difference of exploding is actually like every frame is pretty different. Um, so it's worth, I just think it's worth experimenting with this and seeing where you get. Um, I started teaching this in the very first class and like people got really into it. And the thing is like, I've seen maybe three or four other people 
like actually work in next stream prediction. And we just like don't necessarily know enough to really like figure out how this works. And like the artistic capabilities of this thing are like pretty unknown to me. Um, so I think it's worth just playing with it. Um, but it is kind of cost intensive and it's a little uh, time intensive, right? So like, I think, I wanna say that I will generally train a model like this in, a, in two days, um, whereas StyleGAN is like a four day or five day training. This is maybe a little bit shorter than that, but it's still a pretty long time. Um, so if you're looking at paper space costs, it can still be a little bit high. Um, you could probably train really early stages of this on CoLab. Um, you might run into a memory issue. I don't know. It's worth playing with. Um, but I would say like, this is just fun. It's just pure chaos. It's like throwing paint on a wall and seeing what happens. Um, so it's a worthwhile model, but I am generally always confused about like, I expect it to learn this thing and then it doesn't, it learns something else completely. So it's an interesting model of like, truly like machine learning is like total chaos, but it's pretty interesting to play with. I'll also say like one of my techniques is to generate these videos, but then just pull out single frames and use those single frames for other, other purposes. Um, so there's some really cool things you can do with some of these frames because they're pretty interesting. Any other questions about um, next stream prediction? Another one from me. Yeah, go for it. Is there a way to loop things without playing the video in reverse? Yeah, no, there really is no way to loop this because each frame is generating off the previous frame and it gets more and more chaotic. Um, I think there's a lot of people who are interested in maybe trying to figure out how to do this in a more um, stabilized version but I haven't really seen any good examples. The only good example I've seen is NVIDIA has a, what's called vid to vid and does some of this work. The problem with that is like, it requires like an insane amount of GPU power to actually work. Um, so it's sort of like out of the hands of us mere mortals. Um, yeah, so you can't loop this stuff either, which is a little frustrating. Um, although I'm sure there's like maybe a technique or something you could do in like After Effects or something to just like sort of fake a loop. Uh, 